Sanjit Banerjee uh, of CII with us, the big boss at CII. Thanks very much for being with us. Was this, uh, well, we were all hoping for a big bang budget. Who, who doesn't? Let's face it, all of us do. Did this live up to your expectations? No, there are areas where we saw uh, that, uh, that we have been talking about, uh, uh, which has been well addressed. One very important feature that I saw was, uh, uh, we must talk about it, is the macroeconomic fundamentals and the fiscal, uh, all of that. Uh, keeping in mind that the government was a heavy spender uh, uh, on infrastructure, capex. So we see that uh, fiscal prudence to be, and the macroeconomic indicators to be very strong factors going ahead. So that's one thing that was one looking for. Second, right. we all talked about employment, employment skilling. I don't think a budget ever had so much on em of emphasis on employment and skilling in the manner that it, is, uh, it has been articulated in this budget. Three, we see trigger points basically where uh, the participation of states and we have been talking about how do we incentivize states because this, how do we get reforms to be carried forward by states and incentivizing states to do the next gen reforms is another very important key feature. And the fourth of course is on capex and infrastructure, the focus on rural infrastructure is, is a very, very, very key thing to see. And of course, and lastly, I would really talk about the, uh, you know, the tax. Uh, I know that, that there are issues in the tax part, which is which you, you are digging into. But on the on the simplification side of the on the direct tax, uh, 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 it, it and, and this focus on decriminalization, bringing down uh, uh, and the rewriting tax. the code in six months. Yeah, phenomenal. I actually. mean, yeah. that that's that's extremely difficult. You know, Mr. Bhutani was telling me. I mean, fin that this the, the time frame. Itself. Me, and the fact that they're willing to do it, I mean, that's quite so something. If you look at the history of the new tax code, it dates back to 2012. Substantial amount of work has been done. Between 2017 and 2019, even the draft code was ready. Thereafter, all the amendments, successive amendments in finance bills have been carried out to incorporate features of the new tax code. So I think the six month target for a new tax code, keeping in mind the objectives, the finance ministers set out, which is ease uh, uh, and uh, you know readability of the law, weeding out old provisions of 1961 Act, in my view, is an achievable target. Okay, Mr. Banerjee, would you say that this is a political budget? You know, the reason why I'm saying, and I have a logic to it, is that in the interim budget, uh, the government focused on capex because there was a great degree of confidence with which they approached it because they were confident about the numbers. They were talking about char so far. This time around, they have tried to address concerns that resonated during the elections, the issues of uh, unemployment, job losses, rural distress. You know, uh, all these are very, very key uh, key features to fe uh, uh, to be. Uh, high up on, in the agenda for any uh, e e economy which is growing so fast, which needs to be a developed economy with a target in mind. You cannot have a section of the uh, 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 economy being ignored. So I, I, I think that the, uh, besides politics of it, uh, it also makes economic sense to focus on states into rural, into the lower income, uh, income brackets. All of that is pretty, pretty, pretty much important to carry. If you see the economic survey, yes. which says that take everyone along no. in the economic growth yes. story of India. Yes. So that gap between the haves and the have-nots, or the gap between urban and rural India, that is being addressed. Something that we saw during elections. No, that's true. It was a key issue, but the markets haven't taken to this very favorably, have they? Uh, hi, Vishnu. Yes. Uh, incidentally, you know, this was a bit of a surprise uh, because uh, we were expecting, of course, tax simplifications. Uh, and uh, rationalization on capital gains, which I spoke to Maria in the morning. But incidentally, they've increased capital gains in short term yes. and long term. And the markets haven't taken very well to those. Uh, I must tell you both, uh, we're down about 450 odd points on the Sensex, Nifty's about 150 points. But I think, you know, the fundamental point is that, um, you know, the budget overhang lasts not more than 48 hours. So fundamentally, medium to long term, uh, you know, uh, capital markets are strong. The Indian economy is looking favorable to capital markets. And the other quick point is, I think they've also done some tinkering with buyback yes. uh, on shares, right? And that is something which is, could be a little uh, regressive in nature. Uh, again, uh, we're waiting to see the fine print. I'm yet to read it. Uh, I've been told there is some clarity which is emerging on that. But that can again, uh, uh, you know, in the sense, would have has put some taxation uh, angle in place to see that there is some stress there as well, which the markets are kind of showing up today, right? Uh, yeah, and the last thing I would say is that 
you know, it, it's been a mix of between push towards manufacturing. They've talked about MSME, which is a very important sector uh, in terms of employ employment generation multiplier. But you know what? We've seen these announcements in the past. Have, has the MSME sector actually been benefited? I think that the execution is a big, big challenge which remains and that needs to be seen very evidently. Sure. You the know, contribution to, uh, one last point, uh, Vishnu, the contribution from MSME, which is manufacturing idly to GDP, is about 13% in India as of now. Uh, the target was about 25%. That number needs to be, you know, has to go up considerably. And the execution lies within uh, how they kind of play that out. You know, there were three areas, Mario, I don't know if you noticed this as well, which we didn't see any mention of, or, or perhaps saw only a fleeting mention of. Uh, health, yeah. uh, education, and defense. Uh, would any of you like to sort of take this question, Mr. Sinha, back with us? Uh, I, I would ask you whether you were disappointed, uh, because, you know, there is so much in the budget, a lot of which we do, the, the minister doesn't necessarily need to read. Uh, but we talk about Atmanir Bhatta in the defense sector. It's a big policy push. It has to be a policy push, but not one word, uh, you know, in, in her speech. And health and education. So I, I want to just uh, divide my comment into two parts. The one that I could follow and the one I have to uh, study carefully. Because if you saw those nine points, the yeah. first one was on productivity increase. Yes. And productivity increase has to, I have to understand what there is on education and health. And there is a lot on skilling. If yes, you saw that, that the means. MSME. So it's difficult to comment when you're just hearing a speech. The things that I can comment on are 4.9%. Big relief. You know, meaning that's, I mean, I was actually not even expecting 4.9. I was thinking maybe it'll be 5. And then yep. to go to 4.5. Now, if you think of it, 120% of our pre-COVID level is our GDP. And we are bringing down our debt faster. You know, both government debt and our fiscal deficit. And Standard & Poor's had already said that there's a positive outlook on us. We could actually get a better credit rating this way. And that would really change the tied totally. You know, the, one of the biggest expenses on our budget is expense on interest. Yes. And if we can start actually starting to tackle that, then you are really looking at it in a comprehensive manner. What is the FY 2024, the present fiscal deficit? 4.9. 4.9. So it's, no, no, it stays. In the FY 25 is 4.9%. No, 4.5. That's 4.5. Next year, it'll go, it's coming down. Right, it's right. From 5.8, it was to have come down to 5.1. And it's come down to 4.9. 4.9. That's a big deal, you know. I mean, that's uh, non-trivial. Dr. Trehan with uh, us as well. In fact, we were talking about health. health yes. and, uh, Dr. Dr. Trehan? Sorry, sorry, Mari. I'm, 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 <laughs> no, no. Uh, we keep talking about healthcare so often with Dr. Trehan. Were you disappointed that we didn't see any Big Bang announcements, at least not in the speech? I'm sure there'd be a lot in the fine print, but were you expecting anything? Of course, we were expecting a lot, but it didn't happen. What were you expecting? So, there are several parts to it. One, the allocation to the budget should be increased so that the public health system can be reinforced more. The other was the allocation to the different government schemes where the payment schedule can be enhanced so that, you know, all the hosp private hospitals are accepting schemes like CGHS, ECHS and all that. And there's a, basically a tightrope walk because of large outstandings. The budgetary allocations could be increased so that this catch-up can happen because the hospitals, especially smaller hospitals, are suffering a lot because their payments are delayed and then they, they are working on a very thin budget. So that's one. And the other thing was, is that there has been an outstanding issue of GST. Hmm. We pay GST on all our inputs, but we don't get any credit for it. So there's no set off. Uh, on the other hand, the government had placed 5% tax on rooms, room tariffs, which are above 5,000. Um, that also was no set off. So particularly the cancer drugs being cheaper, that would be of interest to the common man. Yes, of course, that's a good thing. That's a very good thing that cancer is actually one of the biggest uh, challenges we have today because the drugs are expensive and if you add duty on it, it makes it even more expensive and unaffordable for people. As you know, 
cancer doesn't know any strata of society. So it could be affecting anybody and especially the weaker section of society come under a huge strain because these are long treatments and the drugs are, are, are expensive. Now, this will help, of course, but that's the only thing that has happened. Also, there is a uh, reduction of duty on X-ray tubes and flat panel detectors and things like that. But that's a very small sucker because the cost of care is actually going up because of the fact that a large proportion of our major equipment like the CT scans, MRIs and, and, uh, and other things, the dollar value is only increasing. So the cost is, has gone up in the last three years hugely. So that's why there is a, always this mismatch that we as private healthcare providers are always trying to keep the cost to the patient as low as possible because that's what's required. But it's becoming incrementally challenging because no actually uh, uh, relief from the government has come in the last two, three budgets. And that's why I think that the everything is getting stretched. Uh, so we were expecting that we would get some relief in view of the fact that the input costs, if they go down, we can pass it on to the patient. But what's happening is the reverse is happening, that the input costs are going up. So this is a very thin line now left. So basically hospitalization in private hospitals, in your case, <coughs> the cost, basic costs would go up. Definitely. Right? See, the so cost of medication, labor, labor room costs, costs and labor of course, costs goes labor up. costs. All input costs like electricity, all these other things are, are going up. So with all the uh, stresses on delivery of healthcare, if help could come from the government, even if GST was set off like for everybody else, we could actually make some provision for the future. Yes. But it's not happening, although and requests... We didn't hear much even on Ayushman Bharat. I mean, the much touted celebratory scheme of the government. They did not talk much about it either this time around. Yeah, so, I'm, it was, I, mean, I was a little surprised because over there, there was this uh, expectation that the scheme would be would be actually enlarged increased. to cover more people, yes. especially the idea of elderly people, 70 yes. year plus, uh, or even 65 plus, because that would help them a lot. And the second thing is that the uh, the allocation of for the funds for the scheme are also have not been enhanced, at least in the budget. Yeah. Maybe maybe otherwise that would happen. So these are things that can happen to help the common man. I think Nasir Salim had a point to make. Firstly, fiscal deficit at under 5% is welcome news. But you had a second key point as well. Yeah, no, so two points there actually. One is that, you know, the fiscal deficit is 4.9%, which is looking good. And that will bode really well yeah. with the overall rating upgrade that India may see now over the next few quarters from the international uh, markets. Okay. Also attract a lot of foreign flow in. Yeah. So one is that. The second thing, quick one, is from the sectoral perspective, I think post the budget, I would like to touch upon one sector which now looks a little more stronger, which is the entire consumption piece. With uh, deductions uh, increasing, Maria, we spoke about this in the morning, from 50 to 75,000 rupees, it, it's gone up. So the middle income group will, stand, will tend to benefit on some more disposable income available to them. Also, the uh, extension limit of long-term capital gain from up to 1 lakh to now 1 lakh 25,000 will leave them with more disposable income. So some, you know, uh, numbers So those there. in lower income brackets would tend to have more disposable yeah, income we, is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, because we're seeing a lot of participation now in, you know, listing. And that could be up to 75,000 rupees more annually. Absolutely, absolutely. So that will bode well with consumption and also, you know, they've given some tax rebates on, on mobiles and certain other consumer uh, discretionary products which may also bode really well. So that hopefully uh, should play out. Would you like to come in? Uh, has enough been done to drive private consumption? That's really not my subject, but if you allow me, I'd like to speak on infrastructure. Go right ahead, sir. So there is a very big, I, I think a lot of people have missed a very big message embedded in yesterday's economic survey and today's budget speech, which is that for 10 years, this government has followed a happy and consistent macroeconomic policy 
of driving GDP growth by very large outlays in infrastructure yes. and public expenditure. And that was, in fact, touted as pump priming economic growth. So in the last few years, we have seen infrastructure outlays increase by 25 and 30 percent, 5.5 to 7.5, 7.5 to 10. And the expectation this year was that in the first year of a new government full of energy to again embark on new things, that we would get a 30 percent increase in the infrastructure outlay, taking it up to 13 lakh crores. But what we've got is 11.1, which is a 11 percent increase. So the important point is the economic survey did not talk about in, uh, expenditure led growth, it talked about bottoms up growth and it talked about private sector having to stand up and do its number. Yes. Whether in yes. Similarly, very interestingly, Madam in her speech today, the Honorable Finance Minister, and, and I marked it very carefully, said, we have moderated our infrastructure outlays to take care of fiscal consolidation and to have resources available for other priority areas. She said this in her budget speech. Now that's a very important message and I think in the days ahead, economists will have to now examine whether this leads to a significant shift in macroeconomic thinking of India as a nation. Are we moving away from top-down expenditure-led growth with its well-known multipliers to resetting the issues that need to be resolved lower down to get bottoms-up growth and the, the, her speech was sprinkled with trying to get many other people to do the heavy lifting on uh, yes. financing, which the central government has been doing. She spoke about pushing states, she spoke about private sector, and wonder of wonders, after many years, we are seeing the budget speech sprinkled with references to multilateral development banks. So there's some very clear macroeconomic messages in this budget, which I think uh, will need to be deliberated in the days and weeks and months ahead, as, to my mind, a significant shift of macroeconomic policy and thinking of the country. And I want to make one last point. We are all lauding the control on fiscal deficit at 4.6. Now, it appears to be an universal truth that any finance minister who reduces fiscal deficit is to be lauded. Please remember that among macroeconomists, there is an alternative school of thought that in an economy which is crying out to, for jobs, which is crying out to revive demand, which is crying out to build modern infrastructure and logistics. I don't think many Indians would have grudged the 5.5% uh, fiscal deficit, provided, and it's an important point, provided that extra amount was sorely used to create in assets for the country. So I am not overly excited and lauding or, or, or genuflecting at the altar of fiscal deficit. No, but let me country, ask you. Country requires this kind of expansionary sure. mode. But you are talking about infrastructure and there's been a 2.66 lakh crore provision for rural development, including rural infrastructure. When you talk about the India growth story, rural infrastructure is something that needs to be looked at hugely. Has, is this provision a welcome sign of, of what the is. government intends? Of course it is. And how would it help specifically? Look, any infrastructure outlays for minor and major irrigation, for PMGSY, Pradhan Mantri Gram Sarak Yojana, for, for homes, homesteads, for all of these have tremendous impact, but my comments were largely sure. at, the, at the macroeconomic level where I think these two important messages need debate on channels like yours, saying should we not think and just laud a decrease in fiscal deficit when the country is crying out for maybe an expansion anymore, etc., sure. etc. Yeah. Et yes, so since you highlight the infrastructure aspect of it, uh, you know, this is the 11th budget of the Modi government, 7th of the Finance Minister Nirmala Sita Raman, how would you rate it particularly to do with the infrastructure aspect? Look, I would be apprehensive and I'm being very candid with you on the channel. For years now, we've been told by the honchos in the Finance Ministry that one rupee spent on infrastructure results in three rupees of GDP and one rupee spent on direct benefit transfer results in 90 paisa. The multiples in construction sector of six and seven have been used for the last 10 years to build the narrative of how large infrastructure spends are pump priming the economy. Many of the measures announced today of setting stuff that needs to be set and in all positive, whether it's in urban infrastructure or whether it's in green energy or whether it's in rural areas, there's a whole lot of stuff that the FM has said need to be fixed right. from land digitization to land records, etc. But many of these are going to play out in the next four or five years. You're suddenly not going to see bottoms up growth and you're suddenly not going to see private sector put money into infrastructure because there aren't many PPP projects. So you're going to see potentially 
I am, I am, I am apprehensive that you are going to see a stress and strain on GDP growth because you have pulled back the multiplier effect with an 11% allocation as distinct from a 30% allocation in the last few years. Okay. It's a serious point. Okay. Uh, you know, you have, Vivek had to leave, so let me put you on the spot. Now that we've seen the budget, discussed various aspects, how would you rate this budget 1 to 10? You know, in some ways, at least on the tax front, it's a brave budget. And I say brave budget with, with great degree of caution. It's a brave budget because the government is taking the call that India is an economy which has tailwinds behind it, and therefore, even if slight adjustments are done, so as to keep fiscal deficit, etc., in check, they, that will still not stop the virtuous investment cycle. Let me give you two examples. Uh, the increase of long-term capital gains tax from 10% to 12.5% clearly is, is a signal that the government believes that there is enough uh, returns coming out of the public markets. Clearly is also a signal to foreign investors to say, we will treat you at par with the residents, and therefore your, uh, your rate of tax from 10%, we will take up to 12.5%. So there is a slight element of bravery involved. Sure. The point that he was making on the fact that the government wants private sector to step up, and the economic survey also indicated it, yes. the government wants private sector to step up and take its uh, uh, onus burden of the, investing, uh, of the investment cycle is also a very interesting one. Uh, I would have expected that if the government were doing this, in the interim budget that extended the extension available to sovereign and pension funds to invest in India up till March 31, 2025. There was a widespread expectation, and these guys invest in infrastructure and the like, that that would be extended in a full budget. After all, if you could make that change in an interim budget when you make no changes, the expectation is that the government thinking is that you will expand on it. Sure. The government chose not to do it. So the signal or, or the thinking in the North Bloc seems to be there will be inv investment because we have tailwinds, there will be investment because of the geopolitical situation and we can take a little bit of chance or will it with, be, with some of these things. You know, sure. Or is it because they realize that the narrative of in not enough jobs is actually hurting them? Mr. Magazine, will you actually say that uh, the government's argument so far has been that if you invest more in highways, building of these infrastructure as or assets for the nation, it generates jobs. But then the emphasis which has been put on skilling, the internship program, that's an acknowledgement that yes, it may be creating jobs, but, it, but when it comes to the real issue, that is not being addressed. Uh, yeah, mostly true, no doubt infrastructure investments creates jobs, but you know, there wasn't enough talked about other service industries which are going to provide jobs. No doubt construction is one of the, after agriculture, one of the largest areas of jobs, but what about retail? You know, and we are talking about low-skill kind of jobs, right? We can, of course, uh, where the biggest uh, gap is. Uh, there is hospitality industry, there is retail industry. Uh, you know, there are many other service industries where the government needs to kind of encourage where the jobs uh, should go in. Of course, the, the, the budget talked about putting money in, skilling in the institutions, uh, expanding uh, this internship uh, program you talked. I, I don't know, I hope this is only for the public sector. Uh, uh, companies, they, they're not going to force private sector to do internships, you know. So, no, no, absolutely, yeah. top 500 companies. So, so, so uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of that forcing for anything like this. But you don't have to give a job. It's just a one-year internship. Right. And I think there is a government subsidy on the salary for the first year. Yes. And the CSR. Yeah, and the only, no, only uh, what I have to read the, f uh, I think the CSR part was very interesting, but it only says certain percentage of CSR. So I wish there was no percentage of CSR because that helps then you can use a CSR for that. So it's not I've got that detail, I'll just read so it's it like out. like a uh, small percentage of CSR. Internship in 500 top companies to be encouraged, 1 crore youth to benefit from the government scheme. Internship allowance of 5,000 rupees and one-time assistance of 6,000 to be provided under the internship scheme. Now, I assume that that 6,000 rupees comes from the government to the company, though I'm not sure if it comes it. from the government to the, to the young employee or, or the young intern. Companies to bear training costs from their CSR funds under the government's internship scheme. Then they've got accommodation and everything set up, uh, you know, linked to this. So but, it, it's, but it's important. But I heard something, there's only a percent. I hope, uh, I hope it's, if it's full CSR, it does, definitely helps uh, for the money to go in. But I heard there was a percentage of CSR you can use for it. Not the entire thing, but, that you have but yeah, the fine print you have to think. But certainly lot jobs and scaling, there was a, a, the good part of this budget, it hit all the headlines which are for the, for the economy, which are great, uh, beat infrastructure, 
uh, for me, one other area was very big called digitization of land. Uh, That's and, huge. And, Using and, satellite and this imagery. is not for real estate only, it's for manufacturing anything. Uh, you, if you have to do in our economy, if that is implemented, the challenge is, uh, of course, she talked about rural land also, which is great, uh, urban land, but a lot of this is state uh, led. It's a state subject. Sure. But if this is implemented, can you imagine our courts? will have less litigation because we talk about millions of litigation uh, the, no, the knock on effect will be huge real estate second is that investment going in or if you have to take loan also yeah if the and this is all also happening in microfinance already the states where the land is digitized a lot of the microfinance companies are able to lend okay mr in. magazine i'm asking you to hold your thought because i'll come back to this and it's fascinating the use of satellite imagery uh, to plot uh, land holdings across the country. Imagine the benefits in, in, in hilly states as well, where it's been so difficult for Tehsildars to actually map out land.